We're here today with Professor Maggie Levenstein, who's a professor of economics at the University of Michigan, and she's also one of our initial uh, grantees in the INET grant program. Um, she wrote a proposal to do a study of the long-term costs of macroeconomic stability, um, the destruction of the innovative networks in Cleveland, 1920 to 1940, um, innovative networks of, uh, I've read the grant proposal, of, of inventors and finance and so forth. It really looks like a fascinating picture of life in that, in that period, um, and, and I knew nothing about this. What you call the Second Industrial Revolution, Cleveland was the center of it? Well, I wouldn't say Cleveland was the only center of it. Uh -huh. the, the American manufacturing, Midwestern manufacturing belt was clearly the center of the Second Industrial Revolution in the United States with the growth of a range of industries like the electrical industry, the automobile industry, um, chemicals, steel. What was interesting about Cleveland um, is that Unlike, say, Detroit, which really became specialized in a single industry, Cleveland was a leader and an innovator, not just um, in each of these different industries. Our study actually goes back to about 1870. That's where we started. And what we found was a, a real pattern of lots of startups in Cleveland, inventors um, who are either from Cleveland or who often move from New York or Connecticut. There was a real connection to the sort of uh, the community of inventors in Connecticut. Moved so to this Cleveland. was like a Silicon Valley. This was like a Silicon Valley. They're moving there. They're starting firms. They're spawning off new firms. Um, they inventors come and they work for someone for a little while. They get an idea, and then the investors in the original firm invest in the new inventor. And instead of keeping them in house, they go out and they start a new firm. And you get networks of firms um, in, uh, focusing in each of these different industries. And you see this as a continuing. Um, throughout the 19th century and into the 1920s, there were still lots of startup firms, lots of independent inventors and lots of inventors starting firms or starting out as employees and then going and starting their own firm. And the, the and this was all financed locally. There's no, um, uh, well, what Money they, coming in from New York. Yeah, I was going to say, they would, the what they would call market. foreign capital, right? Money coming in from New York yeah. uh, is, is not important for these local uh -huh. firms. These are local investors financing this. And they're not, they're not what you would call today a venture capital firm, but they did call themselves capitalists. And they, were, they started banks. They started a Cleveland Stock Exchange. Um, and they actively created markets in the firms that they invested in. But for the most part, they weren't... Um, investing in these firms in order to take them public and in order to um, sell off their investment. For the most part, this, these are long-term investments that you see. Um, so what happened these to these people? So they, so they got smashed in the depression. <laughs> well, <Yeah? laughs> um, so what we're doing now with this yeah. current project is to look at what happens to these people in the 1930s. And it's interesting because what happens to them seems to vary with their age a little bit. The older inventors, the older guys who've already started firms, some of them their firms stay in Cleveland the whole time and maybe they're inventing less, but they're still around. Some of the firms clearly fail um, and, the, and uh, there are a bunch of guys who simply stop inventing. In other cases, other younger inventors leave the region. Um, and they, they, move, they move to California, they might move to New York or Texas, but they leave the region. So you get um, younger people leaving the region, which disrupts the vitality of the region. You also see the disruption or the destruction of the financial relationships, which really had supported the growth of these, of these new firms and these startups. Um, there are a lot of local financial institutions. And all in the through the 1920s, they're very carefully looking over every loan that they make to local firms. And then in the late 1920s, you start to see they're making large loans that are call loans to New York. And there doesn't seem to be any discussion, any what we would think of as due diligence, at least in the written record for what we can see. And did you say this is in the late 20s? This is in the late 20s. Yeah. And when so everyone is making call loans <laughs> yes. in New York. Yeah. Yes, and you see this and it makes you want to cry because you can see the, the, the capital that was going to 
uh, finance local firms is instead being pulled off into speculative activity and we know what's going to happen to that. Now that makes me think, so do your idea for this project or, the, or extending it to the depression, is that connected to this crisis we've just been through, this financial uh, crisis? So I would say we're economic historians, so I think that we were, we were sort of moving forward in time. We're also, I live in Michigan, we're keenly aware of um, what's happened to the Midwest, the decline not, in just, not mm -hmm. just in the current crisis, though it certainly made things much worse, but the deindustrialization of the Midwest, um, and wondered what happened to the vitality of this region um, in the post-war period. You see there, there's, there's growth and there's, there's employment, there's production, but you don't see these regions leading the way that, say, Silicon Valley does um, in terms of innovation in a broad variety of sectors. And so our, our question was what happened to those, uh, to that, those innovative networks. Now you say you're an economic historian and you've mm -hmm. mentioned a couple of kinds of information that you're, you're looking at, mm -hmm. documents. Um, what, so, so let's just bring that up and look at that. What, what sort of things, how do you, you seem to know so much about these, about these inventors. How do you find this stuff out? Well, it's a lot easier today than it used to be. So for things like um, the patent records, it used to be that you had to go through the annual, the hard copies of the annual reports of the Commissioner of Patents. But today, Google has scanned every patent ever issued, and you can look up the in, every single invention issued to a, uh, an inventor in Cleveland in Google Patent. Now I have to tell you, the scanning technology for scanning uh, old fonts is not very good and you have to be a pretty, you have to be careful, you miss a lot if you just rely, if you just rely on Google, you will, you will miss a lot. We've also looked through city directories, again those are both reading microfilm, but some of them have been digitized and you can find them online. The bank records that we work with are held in archives and you have to go to the archives and get your hands dirty and look through them page by page, box by box, you know, letter book by letter book. There are also a lot of company histories we've read and you can sort of reconstruct the lives of companies, both sort of who founds them and where they get their funding from. And you, you mentioned databases, so you're constructing electronic databases to keep track of yes. this network yes. that you're so talking we about? Have, so everything that, so the information that we've collected um, is uh, has gone into the into uh, an access. It's a you know relational database that allows us to track the relationship between inventors and firms and um, and financial institutions um, and to reconstruct these networks. It's nice because it allows us to bring both qualitative and quantitative um, techniques to our analysis. Um, it's more fun um, to actually have the inventors come alive. You really see these people and what their lives have been like. But to make a convincing story, you have to do more than just tell the stories of a couple inventors. You have to talk about how representative they are, how, how they're different from um, the patterns of invention and firm formation in other regions at the time um, and how it's different from what came before and after. So the qualitative and quantitative um, aspects of our research um, both make it more fun for us and I think more convincing um, as as in terms of giving us an understanding of the period mm -hmm. um, and of the dynamics. So your research is really all in in this economic history mode, um, mm -hmm. but you're teaching in a business school, um, uh, and, and so you have this other side of yourself that connects up to this somehow? I've taught in the business school at the University of Michigan for I guess about a dozen years now. Um, I, I like it a lot. I like um, interacting with people who have business experience, who work in the business field. Um, we have students who come from all over the world. Um, uh, a lot of them actually are engineers who are making the transition to management and they want to get MBAs. Um, and so that's an interesting group of people for me to learn from. Because they're the kind of inventors sort well, of that you're studying in history? Yes, and because they're the kind of inventors that I'm studying, um, but also because I think they capture something about what's going on in, um, in, uh, in industry today. One of the things that you see actually is that we, there were the incentives for people to stay in inventive activity, in engineering, in science-based activity um, are not as great as the incentives to move into other kinds of management and financial activities. Well, you faced a decision like this yourself, I suppose. You, you have a good undergraduate degree, I have to say, from Barnard College, where I, where I teach. And that was in economics? It was in economics. And you decided to go on for the PhD? I 
did. What Why what did what caused I you to do that? that? Well, I have to say, at the time, I thought I was having so much fun studying economics that I just thought I would keep doing it. Um, and at the time, I have to say, I thought I won't be an academic because that's a, you know I should do something more useful than be an academic. Um, uh, um, but I thought. But I'm having fun, so I will keep doing this. And um, I went to Yale, where my undergraduate advisor had gone. And um, I had the idea at the time that I would study macroeconomics and international economics, because it seemed like the, the challenges of international macro were sort of the, the critical issues of the time then as, as now. But it was the moment at the, the height of the rational expectations revolution in macroeconomics. And I remember sitting in Jim Tobin's class at Yale, and he was, he was a great professor, and I learned an enormous amount from him, but you could tell he was sort of depressed. Mm -hmm. And he wanted us- About the future of about macroeconomics. About the future of and, macroeconomics. Yeah. And you sort of felt like what he wanted us to do was, um, was to write down something which could prove to economists that there could be involuntary unemployment. And I thought, you know, I don't need to prove to somebody that there can be involuntary unemployment. That's not a useful way to spend my life. Um, because you, you thought, this is a fact about the world. This is a fact about the yeah, world. Okay. And mm -hmm. it's important to understand yeah. how it, what causes it and what might, um, what might get, might, might eliminate it, what might reduce it. But proving to people that it could exist seemed to me like a not very so fruitful then you did. debate. And Industrial so organization so, and, economic and economic history. history because you actually, and the rest. The rest is history, <laughs> yes. Well, then you learn about how economic history and industrial organization gave me the opportunity to learn more about how um, our economy actually works today and worked in the past and how it had gotten to it. it was. I actually teach macroeconomics in the business school, so I still get to do that, but I get to do that in a way that's much more informed by the institutions that actually conduct macroeconomic policy and influence our macroeconomy. And that's what business students are interested in. Um, as opposed to um, debates among macroeconomists. Mm. Um, well, that's, so that's a very interesting trajectory, and it's brought you to this really very fascinating project that is very rooted in the real world, okay? Mm -hmm. Facts that we didn't know before. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I just really look forward very much to, to learning more about this fascinating period, the second industrial revolution, the Silicon Valley that we never knew, in Cleveland, of all places. So really nice to get to know you, Maggie, and welcome to our community of INET economists. Thank you very much.